So let's get cracking then with the press preview, our first look at what is on tomorrow's front pages. And tonight we'll be checking out the headlines with The Telegraph's chief political correspondent, Camilla Turner, and The New Statesman's senior political correspondent, Harry Lambert. A very good evening to both of you. We're going to take a look at the front pages uh, before we chat to our guests, starting with the Metro, leading with the Chancellor's stark warning that we'll all be paying more tax following his budget. Tax rises for all and energy help just for the poorest is the lead story in the eye. A top A&E doctor says he's desperate to stop his elderly patients from going into his hospital. He fears they'll never come out again and that's on the front of the mail. Meanwhile, The Guardian's front page says up to a third of England's hospital beds are filled with patients well enough to be discharged but with no suitable places to go. The Daily Telegraph leading with Rishi Sunak telling G20 leaders ahead of the summit that Russia is a rogue state. On the front page of The Times is the new deal between the UK and France to stem the flow of migrants crossing the Channel. And the front of the Daily Star claims the government has spent more than £250,000 on cheap alcohol in Parliament in a year while the country struggles with a cost of living crisis. Uh, don't forget, you can scan the QR code that you can see uh, on screen throughout the programme. There it is. Uh, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us discussing them. And to discuss them, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent, Camilla Town, and the New Statesman's senior political correspondent, Harry Lambert. Great to see you this Sunday evening. Uh, lots to talk about, so let's get cracking, Camilla. Front page of the Metro, uh, tax rises, spending cuts, and we're all going to have to pay a little bit more. Um, yes, that's right. This um, Metro front page is looking ahead to the autumn statement this Thursday um, and picking up on some comments from Jeremy Hunt today, who we really haven't heard a lot from him personally. We've had plenty of leaks and hints at what might be in his autumn statement, but his appearance on, on some of the Sunday shows today um, was the first time really we'd heard from him properly about what he thinks um, we should all be expecting. And I think what he's been saying both today and also what we've heard over the past few weeks, really, um, is a sort of ex experiment in expectation management for people, um, really warming people up to the idea that there will be public spending cuts, um, that there will be sort of these tough decisions um, that the government's making, that people will be paying more tax and just getting everyone ready so there aren't any terrible surprises when it comes to the actual day um, of the autumn statement. I think Jeremy Hunt and also Rishi Sunak have really tried to learn from the mini budget experience under Liz Truss um, when the public and more importantly, the markets were really taken by surprise um, and that led to a complete panic and a bit of a meltdown. So we're having the opposite here. Um, lots of um, warming people up to what we can expect this Thursday. Yeah, that's right, Harry, isn't it? Uh, Jeremy Hunt saying today that the markets expect to see debt being reduced. That's true. And I think Camilla's absolutely right. They're doing a much better job of preparing the ground as opposed to the, the Kwarteng era. But they haven't really learned anything from the era of austerity. And I think that the key fact that's been ignored in all of this or forgotten is because it's such a relief to have someone who's seemingly competent, who doesn't want to collapse the mortgage market um, through ill thought through policy, we're losing track of the fact that there's 50 billion that needs to be found. And most of it's going to be found through spending cuts. This is despite the fact that the political climate's nothing like it was in 2010. At that time, the British Social Attitudes Survey showed that about 31% of people wanted more money in public services, which is a relatively low number. It's now 52%. So we're just a very different country. Uh, we've responded to 10 years of cuts, and people want more money to go in to the state. Now, of course, money needs to be found, but it could be found through tax rises. It really is possible to find 50 billion in tax rises if this government just to give one example, was to put uh, capital gains tax on um, primary residences, which is something that was discussed. It's no longer you know, being discussed. It's no longer in today's Metro front page. But to do something like that, for instance, could raise 30 billion. So I think that's the key thing to remember. There's been really good expectations management by Hunt, and we're seeing that in the story today. But, but there is an underlying story here, which is the return of austerity. 
Yeah, front page of the I, uh, same story, tax rises for all and energy help just for the poorest. I mean, Camilla, do you think this is the, the right strategy? After all, general tax rises go against the 2019 manifesto, don't they? And will surely bring more calls for a, a general election. Um, yes, that's right. There are certainly some who would see um, the idea of more tax rises as not particularly conservative. Of course, it's the complete opposite to the ticket Liz Truss was running on, promising massive tax cuts for everyone. But I think given the situation we're now in, even those in the Conservative Party who are sort of ideologically opposed um, to, to tax rises, I think can see um, at least that... Um, we do need to get our public finances um, sort of controlled. We, we need to be reassuring the markets and, and rebuilding confidence in the British economy. Um, so if that means doing things that are um, not particularly conservative in the short term, but that's what it takes to get things back on track, then perhaps that is the price we need to pay. Of course, there are some within the Conservative Party, some of Rishi Sunak's own MPs, who probably don't think this is the right approach and don't think it's um, a very conservative way to do things. And that's part of the trouble he has to, to try and bring everyone along with him on this journey. Um, I think, um, as I said before, just given the fallout from the mini budget we had not so long ago, um, I think at least people are prepared now to do things in a different way um, and to make decisions that just try to get things back on track again. The other thing that I picks up on is um, this idea that the energy relief, which again, under Liz Truss, was meant to last two years, yeah. and that was meant to be universal, um, it's now going to stop at six months um, and then be focused only on the more vulnerable um, members of society. So again, a big break with the policy we had under Liz Truss, um, but perhaps something that people can see um, that given the state of our public finances, it would be a lot to, to underwrite um, the whole nation's energy bills for a full two years. Yeah, I mean, um, there's certainly this... a sense, there is certainly a sense that, uh, uh, that higher earners are going to, 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 to bear more of the burden uh, in this autumn statement. Um, I, sorry to interrupt, because I just want to cover one more story before we go to the break. Uh, it's on the front of The Guardian, um, Harry, the hospitals where a third of patients can't go home. It's something we've covered here on Sky News quite a lot recently, this real issue of bed blocking, where patients are in hospital, they could leave, but they've literally got nowhere to go. Well, this is the irony, isn't it, of the last year, which is Rishi Sunak introduced the national insurance levy in order to pay for reforms to social care. We've now had that cut by quasi Kwarteng. It doesn't look like it's going to be reintroduced. And so the money isn't there to pay for that social care reform. And if you don't have social care reform, then you have today's story in The Guardian where the NHS is having to bear the brunt of the fact that there's not other parts of the system that can take people that they'd like to discharge from hospital. And I think the key fact to remember here, again, is we're being asked to find 50 billion. The government spends about uh, 1,087 billion. So you're looking at a, a cut of around 4%, 5%. The NHS makes up the biggest part of government spending. If you make the NHS more efficient, you can find a lot of the savings you need. And we've really just lost that argument uh, to reform the NHS and to reform social care and then to find the efficiencies that way. And so... The money that Hunt's having to find this week is really important to remember are the consequences of mismanagement and failure on a political level over a long time. Camilla, a really, a really quick thought on this, if you could. Um, yes, I think, as Harry says, this really shows the close link between um, the social care system and the NHS. If we don't properly reform social care and have somewhere for perhaps elderly or, or other vulnerable patients to go when they're ready to be discharged from hospital, it just leads to this massive problem of bed blocking in hospitals. And in turn, that leads to delays in NHS waiting times, in ambulance waiting times and operation waiting times. So even though everyone, of course, can sympathise with all these problems in the NHS, we can see that further down the chain, if we don't sort out social care, then it's just going to make things even mm. worse in, in both the short and long term for, for our hospitals. Yeah, of course. OK, uh, thank you both for the moment. Coming up after the break, plenty more from the papers, including the latest on the midterms. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Harry and Camilla still with us. Uh, let's turn our attention to the United States. Harry, the Democrats have held on to control of the US Senate, uh, as reported by the Metro. They have, remarkably. I was in Pennsylvania last week uh, in the build-up from midterms at a Trump rally and an Obama rally, and uh, the mood in the air was that this was going to be a red wave. And it, it is shocking because Joe Biden's only on 41 percent approval rating. And, and tonight we've got the news that the Nevada Senate seat has finally come in and the Democrats have secured the Senate. Um, historically, since the war, the party in power has lost about four Senate seats on average. And instead, the Democrats are set to gain one. There's, there's one left in Georgia. There's going to be a runoff election in January. And this, was, this cycle was also the, the time when Trump seems to have lost a lot of his power. But I think one thing to say on that, which the piece touches on, is that even though Ron DeSantis now seems like the favorite to become the Republican nominee in 2024, he will very much be in the Trump mold. You know, Trump may be somewhat finished, but Trumpism isn't. Camilla? Um, yes, I think that's right. Very interesting um, development here in the US. Of course, midterms are normally um, at the time when the ruling party um, doesn't fare so well. It's an opportunity for, for people to sort of air their grievances. Um, but in fact, um, Biden's done much better than, than expected. And as Harry said, I think one of the particularly interesting aspects of all of this is what it means for Trump and his chances for a political comeback in the future, that the rise of Ron DeSantis and the sort of following that he's been getting, um, and at the same time, senior Republicans turning away from Trump and blaming him um, for, in part, as this article points out, backing candidates who actually don't have popular support. So really seeing this as a blow to the Republicans and with Trump partly to blame for that, mm. um, that's something that many feel could really dent his chances of, of a political future in the US. Yeah, really interesting stuff, uh, isn't it? And let's finish, Harry, with this story about David Beckham. Uh, just explain uh, this to us, because Bex has um, been an ambassador, hasn't he, for the, the World Cup in Qatar? Yeah, and, and uh, Joe Lysett, the comedian, is saying uh, he'll give him uh, a 10K if he, if he pulls out. It's not quite clear why Beckham would take him up on the offer, other than public pressure. And, and we, know, we know Beckham to be an honourable man from his his days queuing in the state funeral for the Queen. So we'll see if he does it, but I'd be amazed if he takes up this, um, this offer. Yeah, there's been a lot of controversy, hasn't there, um, uh, uh, amongst uh, celebrities and commentators who uh, have taken quite a lot of money to, to take part in, in the World Cup. Uh, OK, we must leave it there. Uh, we've run out of time. We shall speak to you both again in uh, half an hour or so. Camilla and Harry, thank you.